Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Hot Seat, session six. I'm so happy to welcome you all to this uh, series of webinars. And today, a very special friend, a very talented surgeon is my guest, Costa Nikolopoulos from Greece is here with us. Hi, Costa. Welcome to the Hot Seat. Hi, Ahmed. Hi, hi, Ahmed. Hi, everybody. We are so happy to have you with us today and to all the audience, Today, we will have a very great discussion on optimizing the implant sites with osteodensification, one of the hot topics in the field of implant dentistry. And you can hear it now from the one of the pioneers and one of the true educators in this field, Costa Nikolopoulos, which I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with his courses, with all he's done to implant dentistry. And again, I'm so happy to have Costa with us in this webinar. Costa, as a tradition, I'm gonna have a brief introduction of your CV to the audience, and then we can proceed with the presentation. Dr. Costa qualified as a dentist in 1984, receiving his dental degree from the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. He received numerous awards, including the gold medal of the Dental Association of South Africa, for the most outstanding graduate. In 1990, he completed his four-year full-time postgraduate oral maxillofacial surgery trained at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa and was in Johannesburg and was awarded FFT MFOS. Since 1991, he's been practicing as a full-time maxillofacial surgeon specialist concentrating on immediate loading of dental implants in his private practices. Also, with his amazing prosthodontist, Petros Yovanoglu, they established same-day dental implant clinic in Dubai from eight years ago. And since then, they have also activity in same-day clinic, which is also the Brandenmark Osseo Integration Center and Zaga Implant Center. I've been to Costa's clinic very well organized, very beautiful clinic, and he's very famous for immediate loading cases, as I mentioned. And I'm pretty sure after his presentation, you will truly understand what I'm saying. They have done lots of duets uh, in presentations with his prosthodontist Petros over the world. And I'm pretty sure you will all enjoy his amazing presentation today. At the end of his presentation, we will have about 10, 15 minutes discussion, so don't miss that one too. Costa, we are ready totally to hear your amazing presentation. Thank you very much, Omid, and uh, I'm also extremely happy to be uh, on the hot seat <laughs> today here uh, uh, on your webinar series. And uh, there's, uh, in my opinion, there is no hotter subject to discuss than uh, the subject of uh, osseodensification. Uh, and um, uh, the experience that I would like to share with uh, you and all our uh, colleagues all over the world looking at this webinar is based on uh, work that uh, I've done uh, in the last uh, many years, both in Athens as well as uh, at our same day dental clinic in Dubai. So we're going to be talking about uh, osseodensification, uh, which is based on a revolutionary uh, denser bird technology and right from the onset, let's give credit to the developer of this amazing technology, uh, Dr. Salah Huawei's, uh, who uh, worked very hard to develop uh, this uh, technology in the USA uh, about five years ago. So it's a relatively new um, tool that we can use in our uh, uh, implant toolboxes. Uh, it's not a magic tool that can uh, solve all our problems, but it certainly can optimize uh, our cases, in particular difficult cases. 
Now, let's start with a definition. What exactly is osidentification? Basically, it's an implant site drilling technique that preserves bone bulk and predictably allows for three things. Number one, high primary stability, and as we know, that is key, especially to immediate loading. Number two, subcrystal sinus floor elevation. And number three, ridge expansion. And as I said, this uh, technology is based on the denser burr, which is a multi fluted burr developed by Salah Huawei's. Uh, the, um, the key features are that it is multi fluted with non cutting edges when run counterclockwise, when run in reverse. The whole concept is running this drill in reverse. So when it runs in reverse, it doesn't cut, it actually molds or makes the bone into, a, into powder form. And by making it into powder form, it pushes the particles and condenses it into the walls of the socket, into the trabecular bone, as well as at the apical end of the osteotomy. And all this is based on bone plasticity of the trabecular bone. We're going to have to um, highlight the fact that it's trabecular bone. The whole concept depends on trabecular bone. So if you have cortical bone, D1 bone, you cannot osteodensify it and you shouldn't be using it. Of course, you can use the very same drill in a clockwise direction to cut. So osteodensification is a time-dependent, low plastic deformation. Remember, first we get elastic deformation of bone and then we get plastic. Plastic is a permanent deformation. So we, it's a time-dependent, low plastic deformation of what bone? Of trabecular bone. We're going to highlight and we're going to repeat trabecular bone. So by doing that, we do not remove the bone. We actually preserve the bone and we move the bone. So that's what we are doing. We are moving the bone. So what exactly does osteodentification do? Number one, osteodentification, when we drill counterclockwise, look at this now. We are drilling counterclockwise in reverse. Instead of removing the bone, it moves the bone laterally as well as apically, thereby condensing the bone, osteodensification, making the bone denser and allowing us to get better primary stability. The second thing it does is when we have a relatively narrow ridge and we want to expand it a bit, so if we have a ridge that's like four millimeters and we want to make it five or six millimeters, we can at the same time as causing the densification, we can expand the bone laterally. Of course, the precondition is that we have enough trabecular bone to do this. So have a look at this here. Have a look at these requirements. In order to do this plastic ridge expansion, you must have at least two millimeters of trabecular bone and your trabecular to cortical ratio must be greater than one to one. So we must have more trabecular bone than cortical bone. If we have only cortical bone or if we have less than two millimeters of trabecular bone, we cannot do it. Another condition is we must have a four millimeter coronal width up at the top, at the crest. And it's much better to have a triangular shaped ridge than a square shaped ridge. So have a look at this alveolar ridge. We want to cause some osteodensification, but we also want to cause some expansion here. So uh, we start off with a uh, four millimeter ridge, and uh, by using osteodensification, in other words, counterclockwise, we can create a five millimeter osteotomy and still have some buckle plate left. And if we don't have enough buckle plate left, we can also do a veneer graft. And at the same time, as we are Causing this lateral expansion, we are causing compaction order grafting. The drill, this denser drill, takes the bone particles and compacts them into the trabecular spaces of your lateral wall as well as apically. And that's called compaction order grafting. So the conditions are that we need to have enough 
trabecular bone like we have on our um, left hand side and then we can do plastic ridge expansion if we have less than three millimeters or if we have less than four millimeters of bone we need to do a modified ridge split expansion so have a look at a case like this where we have a, a, a narrow ridge this is a, a relatively young person with a narrow ridge uh, we can use narrow implants and together with lateral ridge expansion we can optimize the case and have this type of result this is a case we did in 2016 in dubai and uh, uh, if we have a look we managed to do ridge expansion and get this result now let's get back to the compaction autografting which means that as we are drilling in a clockwise direction we are using those little bone particles and we are pushing them both laterally and apically and that is caused by a hydrodynamic compression wave so this drill that you are seeing here in the middle picture this denser burr is able to create a hydrodynamic compression wave of course the whole system depends on very good irrigation so it pushes those little mold bone particles it pushes them laterally and apically and that's the whole concept those flutes which are not cutting together with the irrigation causes a hydrodynamic compression wave which i will show you in a moment have a look at this on the left hand side you see a normal traditional traditional drill but on the right hand side you see a versa drill let's run them both in reverse in a viscous medium in a viscoelastic type of gel let's run them both and see what happens let's go back here just to, excuse me for that okay let's if we run this there's your that's your um, uh, counterclockwise signal that we're going to run it in reverse and let's see what happens and let's run this one too in reverse so now we're going to run them both in reverse hopefully it will work this time All that is happening on your left hand side with the traditional drill, we are not creating a hydrodynamic compression wave. Basically, we are just burning the bone. And you'll see when we take this out, nothing's happened. Now, if we go to the to the right hand side, and I hope I get this to run now. It's not running. Anyway, I apologize, I can't get this video to run, but basically you're gonna see a hydrodynamic compression wave if we could get this thing to run. Okay, let's proceed. So, if we are dealing with very hard bone, let's say cortical bone, we can use the same drill, the very same drill, to run it clockwise, and then it becomes an exceptionally good cutting drill, which actually extracts the bone. It doesn't condense the bone, it extracts the bone. And that's what you see here. The third thing that we can also do is subcrestal sinus lifting. So by running this anti-clockwise, we can push the bone not only laterally, but we can also push the bone apically and cause a sinus lift. And uh, together with site-specific implants like angled implants, uh, we can avoid doing a traditional sinus lift. We can uh, place our implants at the same time and avoid extensive, lengthy, and costly sinus grafting procedures. 
part of the success of these drills is that when you run them counterclockwise at 1,200 revs per minute, we actually do not cut the sinus membrane. This is an LPRF membrane, which is 0.3 millimeters in thickness and corresponds more or less to a, a sinus membrane. Uh, you can see that the membrane was not cut as long as we don't exceed three millimeters into the sinus. And I'll get back to that in a moment. What you are seeing here is the, the trademark or the hallmark of osteodensification, that white halo around the osteotomy. Have a look at the halo, which is basically the mold particles that have been spread laterally, but also have a look in the depth of the osteotomy. You'll see that the, um, the particles are also pushed apically, apically where? Towards the sinus. And one can ask a question, doesn't it worry us that the walls of this osteotomy look rather avascular, white? What about the blood supply? Is that maybe a worrying factor that we are compromising maybe the blood supply uh, of this osteotomy? And uh, yes, it is something that did worry us. But if we look at this, we find the answer. This is an osteotomy, courtesy of Professor Nelson Pinto from Chile in South America. What he did is uh, he wanted to assess bleeding in the osteotomy. And he used a 40 times endoscopy lens. There's your intact sinus membrane. And have a look after a short while, after like a minute or so, you see the capillaries start bleeding. And now there's one more. So there's actually two. And there's a third one starting deeper than that one. And if you have a look at a little bit towards top left, you'll see there is another one starting. So the answer is no, we are not concerned that the osteotomy does have a good blood supply. And the fact that we are densifying the osteotomy doesn't mean that we're cutting off its blood supply. Now, as far as sinus lifting is concerned, there are three protocols. There is a protocol one, which means we have at least five millimeters of alveolar ridge height before we get to the floor of the sinus. Protocol two means we have four to five millimeters of height. And protocol three means we have two to three millimeters. Of course, Rules and protocols apply strictly, and we need to uh, observe the following. Let's look at protocol one, which means we have greater than five millimeters. We need to have a minimum bone width of four millimeters. So that's a, a strict term that applies. You must have a minimum width of four if you have at least five. So you measure your bone height to the sinus floor. Of course, you've got to use a CBCT. And your pilot drill, uh, this, is, this corresponds to the set here. This corresponds to your versus set, your pilot drill, which is here. Um, you need to stop one millimeter below the floor of the sinus. Otherwise, if you go to the floor, you may perforate the membrane. Then you... Um, Use your two millimeter denser burr, which is up here. And that goes up to the floor of the sinus, but not into the floor of the sinus, not through the floor of the sinus. You then go from your two millimeter to your three millimeter drill. And with a three millimeter drill, you're allowed to go up to a maximum of three millimeters past the sinus floor. So very important take home message you only enter the floor of the sinus with your three millimeter burr running counterclockwise at 1200 rpm with lots of irrigation you do not enter the sinus floor with a two millimeter drill or the 2.3 millimeter drill if you do you will very likely tear the sinus membrane so you're only allowed to enter with a three millimeter. And at no stage 
should you should your drill your burr go in more than three millimeters so remember the three millimeter rule you only enter with the three millimeter drill you only enter the sinus in other words you go past the floor of the sinus with a three millimeter drill and never more than three millimeters past the floor at any stage you then go to your next drill which will be the four millimeter or the five depending on what size implant you want to use now let me also highlight another important point please note we said two millimeter three millimeter four millimeter we didn't say two 2.3 2.5, 3, 3.3. In the beginning, when I started using this, I didn't pay attention to this, and I thought I will be kind to the whole system and I will drill uh, in a more gradual manner. In other words, 2, 2.3, 2.53. That doesn't work. You need to drill in increments of one millimeter each time wider, and there is a reason, and I'll show you a slide just now. That is in order to capture that thickness of bone around the osteotomy in order to have bulk volume to push that bone not only laterally but to push it up towards the floor of the sinus so take home message we drill in increments of one millimeter second take home message we we never enter the sinus floor with anything less than three millimeter we only enter with a three millimeter let's look at a, an example so this is a protocol one which means we've got more than five millimeters of bone in this case we've got eight so we take our pilot drill we stop short of the floor of the sinus with the pilot drill the pilot drill is not an osseodensification drill by the way no. we always drill at 1200 reps per minute we are drilling counterclockwise with the um, also densification drills. With well, a pilot drill, we can drill clockwise. It's a pilot drill. It's, it's just a drill. It's not, it's not a, an also densification drill. But with the also densification drill, the denser drill, same thing, denser versus also densification drill, you drill at 1,200 reps per minute. That's a, the, the, the speed is very important. Counterclockwise, counterclockwise means it's in the densifying mode, not in the bone extraction mode and we uh, reach the floor of the sinus with a two but we only enter with a three millimeter drill so here we have entered with a three millimeter burr and we are moving this patient's own bone past the floor of the sinus in other words we are doing a sinus autograph so from an eight millimeter here we can put an 11 millimeter implant we can lift three millimeters if you want to lift more than three millimeters you need to add a grafting material like an uh, allograft or maybe some synthetic material but not xenograft and i'll get back to that not xenograft so um, here is another case we have 8.3 millimeters here of height we enter with our three millimeter drill and we've done a, uh, an autograft here. We've lifted up the uh, floor. A clinical or surgical tip, when you are drilling, let's say with your three millimeter drill, so we reach the floor of the sinus, of course, take x-rays along the road to see where you're going if you're not sure. Take periapical x-rays. When you reach the floor of the sinus, because the floor is cortical, you will hear a vibe, you will feel and hear both feel with your hand, with a handpiece, and you will also hear a vibrating sound. And that's the, the, the tip of the denser burr hitting the floor of the sinus, which is cortical. You need to be patient. You don't push too hard, but you just keep it there. You go. A little bit out not completely out you don't take your drill completely out you take your drill partially out because if you take your drill completely out all those mold bone particles will come out you want them to stay in and you stay there for as long as it takes one minute two minutes three minutes eventually you will feel that that vibrating noise becomes less and less you'll feel it and you'll hear it and all of a sudden there's no more 
vibrating noise. What does that mean? It means you've now mold into little particles the floor of the sinus, and now you have moved everything upwards, and uh, you can go on to your next floor. So there is, there is an acquired feeling for this. And as soon as you start using these drills, these drills you will feel that, um, that resistance, that vibrating noise. Let's now go to a protocol two, which means you have um, four to five millimeters of alveolar bone. But here, there is a new condition. Have a look at this. Minimum bone width needed is now five millimeters. So the shorter the residual alveolar ridge, the wider the requirement. And there is a good reason why that is so. Because you need, you have less height, so you need more width to, to gain bone bulk and, and densify it laterally and upwards. So here you need at least five millimeters. In this case, you do not use your pilot drill. So you see there's an X here. We do not use the pilot drill. We go straight to the two millimeter drill up to the floor of the sinus, but not through the floor of the sinus. We said the floor, we go through with a three millimeter drill here. And then we go to the four or five millimeter drill, uh, depending on what size implant one you use. In this case, because we've only got four millimeters of residual bone, we need to add allograft. Now, when we know we have a case like this, we start off by taking our allograft before we even start the case, at the beginning of the case, we open the allograft and we hydrate it. It's very important that we hydrate the allograft with sterile saline. And you need to hydrate it for about 20 minutes. Because if it's hydrated, it responds extremely well to this hydrodynamic compression wave or to the compression wave that's generated by the, by the, by the denser burr. If it's dry, it doesn't work. And xenograft cannot be hydrated like allograft. And because xenograft has sharp edges, and because we cannot hydrate it like we can hydrate allograft, there is a very high risk that it will tear the membrane. The, allo, the, the xenograft itself will tear the membrane, so we don't use xenograft. And of course, there's a whole uh, issue about whether the xenograft ever becomes uh, bone, it, whether it turns over to bone, which my understanding is it doesn't. So you need to use either allograft in this case or possibly a synthetic. So when you put your allograft in the, in the osteotomy, you need to propel it up into the sinus. Again, your drill, when you propel it up with one motion, it's a, it's a one movement, never more than three millimeters. And in actual fact, I, I prefer two millimeters. Never more than two millimeters past the sinus floor. Even if you reload and refill the off to uh, spread all over the show. We, we will have a look at it just now. So this is a model that I use for one of our training courses uh, and uh, have a look at um, what we are doing here. We are filling up our osteotomy. We are using the uh, last drill that we used, the last drill. 150 RPM counterclockwise without irrigation. This is the only time we do not use irrigation. And by doing that, we are pushing the allograft up. We refill it. Every time we, we fill it and we, 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 we propel it, we gain one millimeter of height. Remember that. Every time we fill our osteotomy site and we take our last drill at 150 RPM counterclockwise, we are pushing the sinus membrane one millimeter further up. So we are gaining one millimeter of, uh, of height. Have a look at this now. We turn it around. We fold it twice. So theoretically, we've gained 
two millimeters. Of course, we've also gained a little bit of height from the autograph that was done with a patient's own alveolar ridge. We've gained a little bit with that as well. So let's have a look at this case. Here we have one question. When we are putting the graph material into the drilling site and we want to push it with the drills into the sinus, should the drill go only to the floor of the sinus or is it possible to also go three millimeters in when putting the graph material inside? It is, you should go up to maximum three millimeters in the sinus with that last drill, but there is a tendency to go two millimeters. Uh -huh. Initially, I think the protocol was three. I have seen some modification, two millimeters. It is safer to go two millimeters. Mm -hmm. My advice is two millimeters. Okay. So your drill can go two millimeters. So please have a look. Can you see my arrow here? Yes. From my mouse? Yes. So your drill should go. This is your floor of your sinus. Your drill should go two millimeters past the floor when you are propelling the bone graft up into the sinus. So, this is a case now with four millimeters of residual bone height, and uh, for some reason here, a 2.3 millimeter drill, osteodensification mode was used to uh, reach uh, up to the floor, but not through the floor, and the next drill is a 3.3. Please note, it was 2.3, now it's 3.3, which means it's a one millimeter increment. So we go in one millimeter increments when we are dealing with sinus. When we are dealing with just osodensifying, you go according to the, uh, the uh, your implant brand's algorithm, which I'm gonna show you just now. So we gain one millimeter and you can see here, can you see here in the middle picture, the x-ray, this is autograft. This is the patient's own bone that was gathered by the, the drill and was propelled not only laterally, but apically into the floor. But that is not enough for us to place, like, let's say an 11 millimeter or a 10 millimeter implant. So, it's only enough to get like two to three millimeters. So there's your sinus autograph. Now we go to the next drill and please have a look at this here. There is a step there. Can you see that step? That step is one millimeter um, in width. So top right, the clinical, the surgical slide top right. The previous drill was up to there. That was the 4.3, and now with the 5.3 drill, with the 5.3, we will take that one millimeter of, of room and use that one millimeter to push it up, and we create this here. So this is our sinus autograft. So we had about four millimeters, now we have about six millimeters of, uh, of height. But six isn't enough, we want 10 or 11. So now we need to fill up this osteotomy with some type of graft material, hydrated allograft, and we use our last drill that we were using. Remember we had four millimeters of height? We're gonna now go to a depth of six millimeters to answer your question, um, Ahmed. So we're gonna, we had four, we're gonna now go up to six, which means two millimeters of this drill is gonna go past the floor of the sinus and we're gonna push that material subcrestally into the, into the floor of the sinus. Have a look here, denser burr, look at the, what it says on the bottom, denser burr should enter only naught to two millimeters beyond the pre-measured crest height when propelling allograft into the sinus. So there's the answer to your question. Naught to two, don't go more than two millimeters. Why? Because if you go more than two, you risk perforating the floor of the sinus. So here it is, fill up, um, graft it, place additional graft, push it up. Every time we gain one millimeter of height and we manage to place, this is one of Salah Huawei's cases, he managed to place 
an 11,5 millimeter fixture in this area. He started with four, he's placed 11,5. Um, at uh, 12 weeks, he does a 30 Newton centimeter reverse torque test, loaded here. This is at 16 weeks, and this is at three years. Very nice picture, but it's only a 2D picture. We want to see 3D. What's happening here? This is, this is 2D. Let's see what's happening 3D. Clinical picture, and four years. Looks very good, stable, nice. Five years, not bad. From four millimeters, we've gone to 11 millimeter implant, 11,5. But this is where the proof is. 3D CBCT, the same case, five years post-op. Bucco palately, nice reformation, remodeling of the floor of the sinus as well as mesiodistally. This is the reproducible and predictable picture you get with these osseodensification sinus floor lift cases. So this is what we want to see. This is another case. This is one of uh, the, our cases from Dubai. Uh, we have a second uh, molar with a class uh, two to three mobility, some periodontal issues, and we have a missing first molar. Uh, we have four comma something millimeters of bone here, height, but we have a nice width. Look at this width. You see the width, go to the bottom uh, right. So if you're going to start on one of these cases, choose a case that has good width. Don't choose a very narrow case, certainly not to start off with. Choose a wide case and choose a case that's got like at least five millimeters of bone height. Don't choose a two millimeters. That's not for case number one. You can do that later once you've done a few cases. So let's look at this case. We said we've got just under five millimeters, lots of width, very good. The bone, have a look at the bone. It looks like trabecular bone, which is nice. You want trabecular bone. So this is the case on day zero. This is the day of the surgery. So we managed to place um, two 10 millimeter long implants. This is 10 by five, this one is 10 by six, six millimeters diameter. And uh, the CBCT looks very nice, but this is day zero. This is the day of the surgery. We had very nice primary stability. This is a hundred Newton centimeter here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we decided to load the case, uh, immediate loading because we had very good primary stability and we were going to join the implants uh, uh, we used multi-unit abutments here. So, um, just to uh, clarify something about very high primary stability, is it a problem if we have very high primary stability? No, it's not a problem. Paolo Trisi, he's one of the world authorities on primary stability, and in this study of his where he placed implants on the one side of a sheet mandible at 10 Newton centimeter primary stability insertion torque, other side insertion torque value was 110. So 10, cent, 10 Newton centimeter, 110 Newton centimeter. He had a look at this and he found even in dense cortical bone, there was no bone necrosis or implant failure. So he, he found no difference between the two sides in terms of uh, bone necrosis, in terms of uh, success, etc. cetera. Uh, the only difference he found, he found a higher bone to implant contact in the, in the case with higher primary stability. So we loaded this case, this was, uh, I think it was five or six days post-op, we managed to get the permanent teeth made then. Uh, now we managed to get the permanent teeth in within a day or two, we can, in a small case like this, we can get permanent teeth. And uh, this is seven days post-op. You can still see some of the sutures here. And uh, what happens one year post-op? This is the important part, that this is the reproducible picture that we see. As long as you haven't torn the membrane, uh, you've stuck to the protocol. You have to stick to the protocol. You see this mesiodistal bone remodeling of the floor of the sinus, the bucco palatal. It looks really good. And this is what you typically and classically see in these cases. So there's your pre-op. This is your post-op one year later. Pre-op here, day of surgery, one year post-op. Very encouraging the remodeling of this bone. This was allograft. 
Let's go to a more advanced case, a case where you only have two to three millimeters of bone. Um, here you need to be more uh, uh, careful and you need to be more experienced. So don't start with a case like this. Have a look at a minimum bone width in this case is seven millimeters. So if you've only got two millimeters of height, you need a wide ridge in order to have bone bulk to do your osseo densification. Forget about the pilot drill, forget about the two millimeter drill. You start with a three millimeter drill. These are important points. If you don't do it, you'll perforate the membrane. So if you've got a case like this and you start with your two millimeter drill, the chances is you're gonna perforate the membrane. You've got to start with a three millimeter drill and you enter the sinus now with a four millimeter drill. You don't enter with a three, you enter with a four. And remember, one millimeter increments, three, four, five. You don't go in between because you can't get the effect. And you add allograft using the uh, last drill that you used. And as we said, never go more than uh, naught to two millimeters past the floor of the sinus. So here is a case, uh, two millimeter height, enter with the four millimeter drill in this case, not with the three. There's your implant there, there's allograft, 12 weeks, one year. Uh, let's have a look at it again. There you see, this is, this is still autograft. This is the patient's own bone that was pushed up. Uh, you can see 60 Newton centimeter primary stability, ISQ of, uh, uh, I think it was 70 something. There it is, 12 weeks, one year. And this is CBCT. This is another case here by uh, Chuck Schumer from uh, Pittsburgh in the USA. Have a look at this, four year result. You see, this is typical. This is typical, this buccopalatal remodeling, mesiodistal remodeling. This is what you should see. Another one of Chuck Schumer's cases. Uh, you see here, there's a big dip in the sinus. This is uh, autograft, there's allograft, implant placement. I see he's done a connective tissue graft there as well connective tissue graft, and uh, there's your 19-month follow-up. And this, the same case, three and a half years, follow-up, beautiful. Bucker palatal, yeah. Now, they took all these cases, some of these cases together from a multi-center study that they did. Uh, they had uh, 261 implants in 222 sinuses. They followed them up eight to 64 months, and they found a 97% success rate. Uh, which is extremely acceptable and very high. Um, so this is encouraging. This is the publication. And I haven't given you many references up to now because all the evidence is on the website. Um, the last time I looked at, there were over 20 references. You can go to this website. There it is, um, at versa.com. You can get all the references from there. But if you don't have time to read them all and you want to read one reference, this is the one. The October 2016 JOMI, this publication is an excellent summary of the whole concept about osseo densification. So before you start using the system, I think you should at least read one good publication that's got the whole thing together. It's this one here. Of course, <laughs> the more we read, the better for us. So by all means, read everything, but definitely don't miss this one. This is the 2016 one. It's this one here by uh, Salahu Weiz and Eric Meyer. Now, what to avoid? Very important. Let's talk about guided surgery. Traditional guided surgery is a problem. Why? Because traditional guided surgery doesn't allow the irrigation which by the way must be chilled. Chilled means from the refrigerator, not from the shelf, especially in hot countries like the Middle East. Um, don't keep your saline on the shelf, keep it in the refrigerator so it's cold, it's chilled. So that irrigation with traditional guides doesn't reach the drill and doesn't get propelled along the flutes of the drill in order to mix with 
the milled bone particles to get to create this hydrodynamic compression wave and push the bone laterally and apically. So you've got to use a special guide, and I'll show you one. It's a new development. It's called the C guide, like the letter C. Why C? Because C means it's open on the one side so that the irrigation can reach the, the drill. The second thing is avoid xenograft. You cannot densify xenograft. It's too dry. It's too hard. It's got sharp edges. So xenograft is not part of the protocol. And also, it does not work in cortical bone. It works in trabecular bone. But if you do have cortical bone, of course, you can use the, these drills. You just use them in a clockwise direction. And what you can also do is, if you want, you use them in a clockwise direction. But before you take the drill out, you change this, the direction to clockwise so you, all those bone, bone particles can still remain in your osteotomy. As far as undersizing is concerned or downsizing, with the osteodensification system, we don't want to over downsize. We don't want to uh, create a small osteotomy for a big implant. We want to undersize about 0.7 millimeter in the maxilla and 0.3 millimeter in the mandible. Those are the, uh, the recommendations. However, when we do um, ridge expansion, you may need to oversize those cases. I haven't gone into great detail because, of course, this is just an overview. And you can veneer graft your expansion cases if your, if your residual buccal crest is thin. And please, if you're doing subcrestal sinus grafts, the sinus lifts, protocol one, two, and three, if it's less than a four millimeter width ridge, it's a problem, very high risk of membrane perforation. You should rather then do a lateral uh, sinus graft, a traditional lateral sinus graft. And what also to avoid, very important, please avoid using copies of these denser versa drills. Why? Because the studies that are coming out of uh, Santiago in Chile are showing that these copies, unfortunately, do not create osseodensification. They actually remove the bone both in clockwise and counterclockwise direction. You can see the bone particles on these, uh, on these drills. Also, um, they don't create this osseodensification rim on micro CT. Can you see this osseodensification rim? That's created with a, with a real versa drill. With the others, you don't see it. Why don't you see it with these three? These three, the three on your right are the copies because the bone doesn't stay inside. It comes out with the drill. And uh, they just don't produce osteodensification. Another problem with the copies is that there's too much chatter. The drill chatters because of the material it's made out of. Uh, when, when the drill chatters, it doesn't create the right size osteotomy. It creates an irregular shape and size osteotomy. Um, so that's what these studies are showing. So the conclusion is that in their testing, these copies extracted bone in both directions, therefore did not produce osteodensification. Now, what about new developments? Uh, new development, and it's uh, actually have been out for a few months now, is the titanium nitride coated uh, versa drills, the gold color, which means that uh, they, they densify slightly better, they cut better, and the bone st sticks less to the drill. So when you take a drill out, this less bone sticking to the drill, the bone stays in those two. And also, uh, the new guided system, this is the new Versa C guide system, uh, which has some guides and, um, and uh, channels. You see the, the C guide, it's open on the one side so that the irrigation can, can reach the drill. And it's also got a stop system so that you can stop in the right, uh, length not to perforate the sinus uh, membrane. And the, of course, there's another one excellent uh, development that's going to be available on the market, I think, later this year. Hopefully, with, uh, with COVID-19, I'm not sure if we're going to be on time, but uh, the, the zygomatic osseodensification denser drills that come out in two lengths, 55 and 80, 85 millimeter um, lengths. And I'd like to share with you some cases 
both from our uh, uh, Athens and Dubai offices. Uh, let's have a look at these cases. These are cases where we've used um, osteoidentification together with uh, some implants that we call site-specific implants, either wide, narrow, angled, um, zygomatic implants, and we fixated these implants into existing bone. So we've used the patient's own bone, and with osteodensification, we've optimized those sites. Uh, the paranasal areas in front of the sinuses, the tuberosity and pterygoid areas behind the sinuses, the sinus walls, and of course the zygoma. And the latest member to the family of site-specific implants is this inverter implant, uh, which is a body shift implant. It's this implant right in the middle here, which is basically an implant that's a combination of a wider apex or apical half and a narrower coronal half. And uh, I'll show you how we're going to use that. So this is a coaxis implant, which is an angled implant. Uh, this is a patient with limited bone and together with osteodensification, as well as uh, um, site-specific implants, we managed to treat this patient without grafting her. Uh, she's a combination syndrome, so if you have a look at uh, the way she's biting, that partial denture is moving up and down, so there's no real vertical dimension to use. Uh, have a look at this case here. It's the same case, limited bone, but we managed with osteodensification and with site-specific implants to give her this result uh, in a relatively painless manner. And there she is. That's the before and that's the after. Okay, so this is it. Now, this is where I want to now spend the next five or so minutes on the inverter or body shift implant. If you have a look at this implant here, it's, it's an implant that doesn't only have a platform shift, it has a body shift. So the body shifts from, let's say, five millimeters apically to a four or a three point something, 3.4 millimeter coronally. And that's extremely suitable for partial extraction therapy or socket shield technique because it gives you the space for the socket shield where you need it. It also gives you good primary stability where you you can afford to have a wider implant. Let's have a look at this implant here. So, this is the implant. It's called the reverse tapered or body shift implant. And uh, it has an apical wider part, which gives you good primary stability. It has a narrower coronal part that gives you the gap distance that you want either for a socket shield or for bone grafting to uh, thicken your buckle plate there where you need to thicken it. And it also comes out in a, a straight version as well as in a uh, angled version. Angled as in a built-in angle. There's a built-in angle here uh, which will allow us to get screw retention. It's got a 12 degree built in angle, but you can of course use the straight version. You don't have to use the angled version if you don't need it. And why do we need screw retention? Well, because of the um, easier laboratory, easier clinical steps, uh, screw retention uh, bypasses many uh, cumbersome problems. And of course there's overwhelming evidence that 80% of peri-implantitis cases is due to undetected subgingival cement. So we can do away with that problem by having screw retention. So let's get back to our case. This is the inverter case that I want to share with you with socket shield technique. So we have tooth number 11, which is broken. There's a periapical area, incomplete root canal treatment, no ferrule effect. So we need to remove this tooth and place an implant. So what we need to do is uh, keep the, the buckle part of the root as a socket shield. So we gain access into our uh, 
root canal filling material and uh, we then use our gates glidden drills to the predetermined length that we've determined from our CBCT or from some x-ray that we've taken and uh, we take a perio probe we verify that we've gone to the depth that we know we should go to to get to the apex there are various partial extraction therapy kits on the market the one that i think is the best one to use is the one by howard gluckman uh, who presented an amazing uh, webinar here on the hot seat yesterday and that's the partial extraction therapy kit that he uses and uh, is available on the market so we now use a fisher burr to uh, separate the part that we want to keep on the buckle from the rest of the uh, from the rest of the root and we try to include the apex in the part that we want to remove it's not always possible to do it usually we don't manage and then we have to remove the apex separately in this case uh, we were able to successfully remove that part the palatal part of the of the root we, we, we separated that and we managed to get it out together with most of the apex there it is and now we want to uh, have a look at what we've got so we've got our root shield there or our socket shield and we've removed the rest of the root together with most of the apex we want to trim down the the socket shield to bone level we don't want our root shield or our socket shield to be above the buckle or proud of the buckle cortex we want it to be at the bone level not superficial to the bone level so we trim that down there are various ways of doing that howard uses a very nice gingival protector it's like a little retractor that he uses which by the way if you have a look at the top of this kit here you see this here there's a space for that retractor we're still waiting for it what i'm doing now is i'm curating with a straight lucas curette i'm curating that granulation tissue that was at the apex of that uh, root i'm curating that and i'm now going to finalize my uh, um, osteotomy using the versa osteodensification system i've used a, a drill extension there because of the neighboring teeth and uh, I'm taking an x-ray to verify that I haven't left any root filling material. I haven't left any root apex there. You must remove the root apex. I also verify the depth of my final osteotomy. This is a 20 millimeter periodontal probe. Um, so if I'm going to place a 15 millimeter implant, one five, I need to place my implant at least three or even better four millimeters deeper than the gingival zenith and of course i want to put it slightly deeper than the than the chamfer that we create uh, at the crest of our root shield i'm using here a, a 12 degree direction indicator this is not a straight direction indicator it's a 12 degree direction indicator i'm using it here together with a type of a surgical guide that I make out of impression silicone uh, bite registration material to verify that with 12 degrees I'm at the right position in the cingulum for screw retention so now I'm ready to place my implant this is your the implant it's the um, body shift inverter implant which as I said is a combination of a wider apical part and a narrow coronal part and the coronal part is which is narrow will accommodate the root shield that we've left there or the socket shield so i'm placing my uh, my inverter implant i'm starting to generate high primary stability here now and uh, i need to tighten the fixture mount 
Otherwise, the fixture mount can come loose. Uh, it's always good to tighten these fixture mounts more to about 45 Newton centimeter if you are um, achieving high primary stability. And what I'm using here is I'm using a zygomatic implant inserter uh, to, uh, to place my implant. And the question is, how deep do we place this implant? Especially when we um, have a flapless situation like I've got here. Now, please notice that on the fixture mount here, there are two black lines. Can you see them? They are three millimeters apart in order for us to know how deep we gain. And we need to place the implant deep enough so that the second black line, this black line here, disappears under the gingival zenith, the highest part of the gingiva over here. We want that black line, not, not only do we not want to see it, we want to, to, we want to disappear. Then we know we're four millimeters below the gingival zenith. That allows for two things. It allows for enough running length for your emergence profile, but it also allows for the formation of the biologic width. So if you only have, let's say, two millimeters of soft tissue thickness, you must place your implant two millimeters deeper than the bone in order to have a four millimeter biologic height. If you have four millimeters of soft tissue, then you can place your implant bone level because then you have enough soft tissue. Because if you don't, what's going to happen? You're going to get bone remodeling and you're going to get part of your implant surface or implant threads exposed. And that's going to create a, a high risk for peri-implantitis. So you must place your implant deep enough. So there's the implant. Please let's look at that. There's your implant. There's the, the chamfer of the socket shield. So the implant is at the, at the deepest part of the chamfer over there. And here we have our other end of the socket shield, which is at the same level as the buccal plate. We, uh, the way we do it is we place a pre-sintered post-ground zirconia cylinder here, and we have a look that we have the right position. We verify that it's for to retain uh, implants. We verify that it's wide enough not to have unsupported uh, porcelain. And within four hours, we are able to, our lab, our dental laboratory is able to cut this down and add porcelain and give us this tooth within about four hours. And that's our final prosthesis. Uh, this is the post-op um, CBCT. We can see our, uh, our socket shield very nicely over here. And if you remember the pre-op, CBCT, that buckle plate was far less than half a millimeter in thickness. Whereas now with our nice socket shield or root shield, we are quite confident we're not going to get either soft tissue recession or uh, buckle uh, plate loss. This is our six month follow up. We can see both of the pillar and the uh, soft tissues are, are nicely in place. Um, I'm going to just go through one more case. Uh, it'll take us about another three, four minutes, and then we're done. This is a case of a zygomatic implant uh, together with osteodensification. And the, the, we use the Zaga, the zygomatic anatomy guided approach, which has been developed by uh, Carlos Aparicio. He's classified the uh, zygomatic and maxillary complex uh, depending on the amount of alveolar recession, the anatomy of the lateral or anterior sinus wall uh, into a Zaga nought, one, two, three, or four types. Uh, the nought one and one are the best, the three and four the most difficult. This is our case. We basically have the sinus extending all the way to the lateral incisor here. Uh, lots of bone loss also on the other side extending here, so we have very little um, bone. This is left hand side. It's a Zaga 4, which means there's, the zygoma is okay, but very little alveolar ridge for, uh, for, for zygomatic uh, fixation. 
Uh, on the right hand side, similar situation. We don't have uh, adequate alveolar ridge, but we have a good zygoma here. And this is the result we got. We managed to get a zygoma on the right, but not on the left. What we did on the left, we used a uh, versa subcrestal sinus lift here. And uh, this is our uh, right hand side. You see the retractor up at the top here is above the zygoma, and we created this channel with the osso-densification drills, which move the bone laterally towards the sinus membrane. This is your sinus membrane here. So we managed not to tear the sinus membrane, because most of our complications with zygomatic implants are related to chronic sinusitis because of oro antral communications and these problems usually arise one or two years later so we want to preserve the sinus we want to stay if possible outside the sinus wherever possible unless we're dealing with a zygo naught or a one where we have enough alveolar ridge so we managed here to preserve this area here preserve the sinus lining and we are now placing our zygomatic um, drill, this is a sudden, uh, sorry, the zygomatic implant, this is a sudden zygomatic implant called the Zygan. We've placed it with very nice high primary stability, um, close to 70 or 80 Newton centimeter, and this is the same article I referred to earlier that high primary stability doesn't cause bone necrosis. When we uh, in get, uh, fire, get high primary stability, we definitely want to tighten our fixture mount in order to be able to uh, place the implant deeper if we need to. And here we have high primary stability of about 70, 80, but we still need to go a couple of turns more. The other part of the implant will come out at the other side of the zygoma, right up here. And here we have our final primary, oh, here we've already put on the multi-unit abutment at 45 Newton centimeter. It's the one abutment, one time concept. We place our, our abutment, torque it, and now we have our implant uh, exposed here, and there are two options, either to leave it like this or to graft it with either an allograft or with some synthetic material, this is an alloplast, this is beta tricalcium phosphate. In this case, it's ethos, ethos beta tricalcium phosphate. So we're grafting buccally, um, as well as reinforcing the palatal um, part of this uh, area uh, with beta tricalcium phosphate, which will be totally replaced, uh, resorbed and replaced in uh, 12 to uh, 12 weeks to six months with the patient's host bone. So once we've done that, we can now close the case. Patient gets PMMA mold temporaries the very same day. This is the patient Zygoma surgery for you. In the hospital, yes. In the hospital. And uh, you got your teeth on the same day yesterday. Same day yesterday. Yeah. And tell me something. How painful is it today? No pain at all. No pain at all. Fantastic. I can honestly say, yeah. no pain, doctor. Thank you so much. I was talking about discomfort yeah. yesterday, yeah. but today, nothing. Give me a smile, please. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, thank you. See you next week. So that's our patient. Uh, uh, his voice is rather hoarse because he's, a, he's had cancer of the larynx treated two years previously, two to three years previously. And then uh, a week later, he gets his permanent full contoured zirconia bridge. And as we can see, the, uh, the, the position, uh, the access hole position is prosthetically very suitable for screw retention. These are some post-op x-rays and the post-op CBCT. We can see the ethos um, on the buckle side of this implant, and now we're waiting for the ethos to be replaced with the patient's own bone. A few slices through the other implants, 
And on the other side, I wasn't, for technical reasons, able to place a zygoma on the patient's left hand side. Here I did a uh, versus sinus lift. Uh, Amit, um, I'm quite happy to stop here. If you want me to go through an all on four case, I'm happy to do so. It depends on what time available we have. Uh, we can have cost about 15 minutes. If it is Perfect. This is a great case. Yes, 15 minutes, I'll complete the whole story. Okay. So this is a very nice case because it, it very graphically shows the concept of osteodensification. So let's look at this case here. It's an obvious dental clearance. Advanced um, periodontal disease. Uh, lady patient in her 60s. Unfortunately, also had a history of breast cancer, has had chemotherapy, completed her chemotherapy about two, three months prior to the surgery. And uh, this is what she looks like. Uh, in actual fact, a very cooperative patient, but this was the condition. And uh, we have a few danger zones. Have a look at this area here, position number 16, danger zone. Why? Because we have a massive area of bone loss in front as well as behind. So we've only got a narrow island to work with. And with osteodensification, we have the ability to maximally use that bone instead of removing that bone, use that bone, spread it, move it, apically, laterally, condense it to get some good stability. The same on the other side, have a look here. Position number 26, we have this island of bone, we have the sinus behind us and we have, we have this bone destructive area in front. So basically we have two danger zones, 16 and 26, and we have one chance to get it right. Our CBCT. And now, depending on what implant brand you are using, you go to this site, this versa.com site, you choose Densifying Reference Guide. And if you are using Camlog or BioHorizons or Neo or whatever, in this case, we are using Southern. You go, you click on there, and this will come up. And it will tell me that if I want to use a four millimeter Southern implant, and if I'm dealing with soft bone, this is, this, this is soft bone here, I must use that, those drills, the pilot, the 2.3, and the 3.3. If I'm dealing with, dealing with hard bone, then I must use 2.3, 3, 3.3, and 3.5. And I asked them, how did you decide what drills to use? And the answer is, it was decided algorithmically. <laughs> Which, I'm not sure how many of us understand that, Maybe you do, Ahmed, you're a bright guy. Um, I think it's got to do with math mathematics. Mm -hmm. it, they, they've worked it out. How, which are the most appropriate drills for your brand implant and the diameter that you want to use? So stick to this protocol. That's, that's the bottom line. So this is our patient. And uh, this is a seven minute video. I often do this to, to, explain to, to explain to the patient. I often do this to explain to the patient where I'm going to place the implants. I draw it for them. And uh, there's the one uh, danger zone that I was talking about, 16. I want you please to pay attention to the fact that when I'm drilling, the irrigation falls directly onto the drill. It is extremely important. Because if it doesn't fall on the drill, you're not going to get the osteodensification effect. Mm. So we've placed our implant and we are getting some good stability, very good stability. And please note that we are in, we've managed to keep the implant in the bone. So now we go to position number 13. This is our pilot drill which we said you can drill clockwise for your pilot, but counterclockwise, please pay attention again. The water, the irrigation is falling directly onto the drill. And when I'm drilling, 
I don't take the draw completely out. I take it out a little bit after one second. Every second, I take it out for one second. Why? In order for the irrigation to run up those flutes to cause the hydrodynamic compression wave. So the way you draw is by intermittently in, out, but not completely out. Do not take the draw completely out. So here we are placing a five millimeter diameter implant. It's an implant with 12 degrees. It's we call a Southern Implants Co-Axis Implant. Have a look at the primary stability. It's amazing. This is 100 Newton centimeter primary stability. Then we go to position number 26, which again is a danger zone because we have an area of bone loss in front and we have the sinus at the back. Pilot drill, 1.7 clockwise, 1,200 revs per minute. I always use a periodontal probe to verify that I haven't fallen into the sinus. I haven't perforated the buckle plate. Please note again, I don't come out completely. I come out every second for a little bit. Let's watch that again. In, partly out, partly out, partly out. Look at that. Come partly out every second. Don't stay longer than one second. You'll overheat the bone. Allow for the irrigation to go in. This is another 12 degree implant. So basically the implant has a bolting angle, which will allow for the prosthetic access hole to come out in a different angle. You see the, the long axis of the implant is that. That's the long axis of the prosthesis, of the prosthetic uh, uh, axis. Again, 100 Newton centimeter. Look how nicely we managed to utilize the available bone without getting into the sinus, without falling into this uh, uh, bone loss area. This is a surgical guide that we make with bite registration material. The same bite registration material that we use to take the bite before we extract the final teeth. So we don't start off by extracting all the teeth. In my opinion, it's wrong to extract all the teeth because you lose vertical dimension, centric relation, you lose valuable um, information. You also, before you extract these teeth, make another guide, which will now sit or index onto your healing caps so that I can see exactly where, say for example, position number 23 is going to be. This is our two millimeter Denser draw, counterclockwise, 1,200. Then we go to the 2.3. Irrigation on the draw. Watch the irrigation on the draw. Notice that I'm not staying in for longer than one or two seconds. And I'm not coming out completely every time because if I come out completely every time, all those bone particles will come out. Please also note that the osteotomy is at a different place to the apex of the of the of the extraction socket there are two different positions we place our implant you see very nicely the long axis which is the blue handle and the prosthetic axis which is the silver handle again 100 newton centimeter primary stability so we've placed our four implants in the maxilla we take the impression using an open tray impression technique the same material, which is a bite registration material, addition cured silicone, very hard, has a D-shore hardness of 90. We use these um, impression trays that have like a silicone, uh, no, not a silicone, a cellophane plastic, makes it easier for us. Now we go to the lower jaw, position number 46. I want you to watch that interradicular bone. We are trying to expand that interradicular bone and at the same time, we are densifying it. And we will notice just now the densification rim. But first, we take our surgical guide and we uh, 
verify that we're in the right position, both mesodistally and buccopalatally. Please notice that rim, that white osseodensification rim. You see that white rim around our osteotomy. That's what we want to see, that osseodensification rim. We are carrying on now, wider draw. Lots of irrigation. Notice that I don't come out completely. We now place our, our implant. This is a six millimeter diameter implant. 100 newton centimeter, multi-unit abutment, one clean abutment, one time. We talk the abutment to 45 newton centimeter and we never remove it. That's the whole concept of one abutment, one time. The, the literature and the evidence shows conclusively that you get far less bone loss when you don't remove your abutment. Let's go to the other side, number 36. There's a periapical granuloma. And please notice, not only did we remove that periapical granuloma, but the type of bone is the type 4 bone. It's very soft bone. Very soft bone. So we are drilling now in that interradicular septum. We are progressively going to the wider drills as per the versa.com algorithm. We are placing our implant. And despite the fact that we had that black looking bone, which was very soft, type four, we managed to get a hundred Newton centimeter. Forty-five Newton centimeter for the multi-unit abutments. Talk them and never re replace them or remove them, unless you have a good reason to do so. So this is our case at the end of the surgery. Uh, same day provisional teeth um, with some metal reinforcement. And uh, this is just an addition of all the primary stabilities that we had. Temporaries on the same day. And uh, Post-op CBCT, just to show that we've managed to get our implants uh, in the right positions. Number uh, 16, number 13, number 23, and 26. 26, 23, 13, and 16. We've got the implants in favorable positions. Two months post-op, remove the prosthesis. This is a two months post-op. Um, the patient gets uh, scanned, uh, scanning. The scanning was done with the uh, three shape by the restorative dentist. These are the, scan the southern scanning flags. Let's just see. Fortunately, I won't be able to give you a lot of detail about the scanning uh, and the whole procedure, but it was this, this case was actually both scanned and um, analog impressions were taken, both digital and analog, and uh, the, uh, the result was that the, um, the scan was accurate enough. I know that there's still not conclusive evidence that for full arch you can scan these cases unless you're using photogrammetry, um, but in this case, uh, the scan worked extremely well. Uh, another set of provisionals was made in order to then duplicate them. Uh, these are the uh, PMMAs provisionals, uh, color shading for the for the for the pink, and these are the uh, permanent uh, full contoured zirconia prosthesis with staining, and this is the final result. We always take periapical x-rays as well to verify uh, as, as much as they worth the, uh, the fit, the before and after, and here is the patient initial provisionals and permanence two months later. And uh, on that note, I'd like to thank you very much, Ahmed, for inviting me. I'd like to thank all the colleagues, uh, all your colleagues for taking time to, uh, to uh, listen to this um, hot seat webinar and of course I'd like to thank staff at our clinic 
our same day and uh, staff at Greece in Greece, as well as very special thanks to these three wonderful ladies in my life, my wife and uh, my two daughters. I'd like to thank them for their support. Thank you so much, Costa, for your valuable presentation and for the time you gave us and you gave to whole audience from around the world during these times. I think it's very precious that uh, people like you, true educators, share their experiences and their knowledge to all other practitioners uh, to be better in their practice. And I'm so thankful for that. And thank you again for accepting this invitation and joining me today on the hot seat. Uh, well, it's a pleasure and an honor, Amit. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, Costa, I have uh, some questions. Actually, you, you mentioned everything very comprehensively, but I just want to um, have them like highlight them and just uh, as a reminder for myself. First of all, about the zygomatic implants. Let's start from, let's go from the last slides to the first slides. Uh, do we need guides for that? Or, I mean, because you are an experienced maxillofacial surgeon and you've done lots of these cases. So for those who are interested to try zygomatic implants, definitely I know that they have to go and have a good education about it just by watching some videos. They cannot try it. They should take courses, be qualified. But just as a question, do we need guides for zygomatic implants to make sure that we are going exactly in the right path or the guide is not necessary? Okay, uh, Ahmed, very good question. I consider myself at the best a, medio, a medium experienced uh, zygomatic guy. I don't consider myself a, um, an advanced guy. At the best, I consider myself a medium experienced guy. And definitely, if I could have a guide for zygoma, I would definitely use it. Mm -hmm. um, Southern Implants kindly made me a guide about, a, about almost two years ago in one of, one of the cases. It was okay, but it wasn't great yet. And I've been following the guides from different people in different parts of the world on Zygoma. Nobody can, at this point, give you a fantastic guide. Maybe very soon we will have a guide. Maybe very soon we will have a good guide, a nice user-friendly guide, and it, it will be most welcome. And certainly I will use it, even though I have some experience, I will definitely use a guide. So people are, around the world are working on it. I personally believe it will come. I'm not sure whether a dynamic guide or a static guide will, will, will be available first. It's a, it's, there's a good chance that maybe we will have a, a dynamic guide, but that means you've got to go and buy a system that's going to cost you thirty to fifty thousand dollars or euros. Um, but at this point in time, I don't think that the guides are ready yet. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, until such time that they're ready, and even though they are ready, if I can just highly recommend, highly recommend to people that want to do zygomatic implants. And um, there are a lot of competent guys out there. There are a lot of competent colleagues that can manage zygomatic implants with the right education. Mm -hmm. I can highly recommend a course that involves lots of theory, virtual planning of your case, on the computer, a 3D printed model of that case that you planned on the computer, a 3D printed model of that case that you planned on the computer, a 3D printed model of that case. This is the case that you planned yeah. and you place the implants on this 3D model. And this 3D model happens to be generated from a CBCT of a fresh cadaver, a fresh frozen cadaver head that you will operate on tomorrow. So today you plan it, 
Today, you operate on the model, and tomorrow, you operate on the cadaver from who this model was generated from. And it's a fresh, frozen cadaver, so it's, it's very lifelike. And of course, there's a lot of theory that goes with this course. And that course, and I can highly recommend it, is given by Carlos Aparicio in Barcelona. Um, he gives the course two times a year, twice a year, typically in June and January. It's a three-day course. It's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday course. Uh, I contribute only one lecture to that course, and that is on the osseo densification. Um, but I can highly recommend that course for people that want to get hands-on training. Mm -hmm. We're also going to be doing, again with Carlos, as well as with Greg Boys Valley from South Africa, a uh, two-day course, not three-day, two-day course in Chicago at the Osseo Densification Academy uh, set up by Salah Huawei. We're going to be doing that. Uh, we're starting that in December with our, well, the, the, the Osseo Densification Academy starting in June, but our, our Zyga, Zyga Medic course will be in December. But that does not involve cadaver. It involves all the rest, but not cadaver. So if you want the cadaver part, you must go to Carlos Aparicio in Barcelona, the Zaga, Z-A-G-A. If, if you Google Zaga course, you'll find all the information. Zaga, Zygoma Anatomy Guided Approach. Zaga. So that's, that's what I've got to say about zygomatic education. Yeah, and, and, uh, yeah thank you for that. And um, I think one of the, uh, the type of the designs of implants that really help in such cases is designs like Southern implants because they the platform has a different angle comparing to the body. So that we, when we place our implant with the angle, but we can have a straight abutment connected to the top, uh, as also you showed in some inverted cases. So uh, for those, because in Iran, we don't have Southern implants available. And uh, my question is for those interested in such system, because it's one of the unique designs around the world, this type of implants. Uh, is it easy to manage? Because uh, usually with regular implants, we drill in the direction that we want and then we place our implants. But in soldered implants, we can have drilling in another direction, but the sitting, of, sitting pad of the abutment is something different with different angles, 12, 25, and et cetera. So for those who are curious in learning that uh, pr process and steps, is it easy or they need, again, some um, guide or something about it, and then get, they will get used to it, and then they can do it? Uh, are you talking generally about angled implants or specifically with zygomatic implants? No, generally about angled implants. Okay, L let me just then answer two parts. Uh, if we're talking specifically about zygomatic implants, is Strauman available in Iran? Yes. Okay, Strauman, in collaboration with Southern Implants, is bringing out or has just brought out zygomatic implants. Mm -hmm. So the implants are manufactured by Southern Implants, but they're marketed by Strauman with the Strauman label. And those implants also have a 55 degree head, a built in angle. Uh, they are a modification, their, their body is a little bit different, they're more in. in in Carlos Aparicio's um, opinion, they are optimized. They have, uh, they, 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 their body is, is slightly different, uh, different shape to cater for Zaga uh, three and four, the more trophy cases. As far as angled implants are concerned, there is some getting used to, but it really is not a big deal because if you have, a little bit of a prosthetically orientated concept. Uh, if you think of the prosthodontist where he wants his access hole, when you think where the restorative guy wants the screw to come out of, it's very simple to know that you've got to, when you're turning the implant, you must stop in this position because that's 
the angle that is going to be the most user friendly for the prosthodontist. So, is there any guide? Uh, let's assume you make a mistake and you, instead of stopping here, you stop there. Then, what you need to do is you need to go around again a maximum of 360 degrees one turn, which means 0.6 millimeter deeper because the thread has a pitch. Pitch means the, the, the distance between each thread, the distance between each thread is called the pitch. So the pitch is 0.6 millimeters. So worst case scenario, you've got to go one more turn, which means you're going to go 0.6 millimeter deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, there is a bit of getting used to, but I don't think it's anything very difficult. Difficult. And um, one last question about the usage of multi-unit apartments that you showed in the, the case of surgery, the video. Uh, what's your criteria in choosing the height of that multi-unit apartments when you're uh, fixing it at the time of uh, surgery? So you yes. choose the same height for all the cases or depend on the height of the soft tissue, you have lots of multi-unit apartments available, yes. so you go with different heights. Absolutely. It depends on the height of your soft tissue. Soft tissue. The heights available are one two, three, and five millimeters. Mm -hmm. Usually, you land up using the one or the two. Usually. Uh, but sometimes you could use a three millimeter. It depends on the, on the height of the soft tissues. Very rare to use a five millimeter, but it is available for extremely thick yeah. tissues. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, for the audience, I think they, uh, they, it's pretty clear. And for the osteodensification, it's very important for them to have the guidelines available for each dental implant system in the website. Absolutely. As and to go exactly with the numbers. So it's not just exactly. like a normal implant systems to go start from two and end to four. So in different systems, in different cases, for example, in sinus is different comparing to expansion. So they should exactly follow the protocols, right? Absolutely, follow the protocol. If, if there's the one, one important message is follow the protocol. And of course, we can't all remember the protocols. Yes. Go to versa.com, go to the website, and you'll find all the protocols. And you'll also find which drills you must use for the implant that you're using today. Yeah, yeah. And you must follow those guidelines. Yeah, because right. if, if you just say, I'm, I'm going to go 2, 2.3, 2.5, 3, 3.3, 3.5, it's not going to work. No, it's going to work. Correct. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Kasta. It was a truly amazing time spending with you during these days, especially. And I'm pretty sure all the audience, all our colleagues from around the world have enjoyed this presentation. And again, I don't know how to thank you, but appreciate your support and accepting this invitation. I'll tell you how you can thank me. You can come over to Greece when this coronavirus goes away. Come over here and we'll go to a fantastic restaurant, have the best fish. I will. So sure. I'm waiting for you. Sure. With <laughs> pleasure. I will be very happy. Okay. Thank you so much, Kasta. Stay safe. Sure. Everybody keep safe, please. And see you all soon. Ciao.